science, including in critical thinking and medicine. Um, I figure we have 30 minutes or 40 minutes in five years. I'm going to talk about something that I um, so that sort of brought me to medicine, um, which is the reason for uh, this, the discussion today. It's not going to be anything really pragmatic or practical. Um, overtly, I want you to get there um, in your own thinking. Uh, based on what I'm going to talk about today. So I feel as though I have to include this. Um, this is a book by Curtis White. The title of my book comes from it. Um, there's also, he took his title from the book uh, a year before and doesn't acknowledge that in the book. Um, and uh, it's a terrible book. Um, I have it if you want to read it, but that's sort of where it ends um, for me in terms of any parallels. Uh, so my uh, discussion today is going to sort of give you a little bit of history on me, which is a little narcissistic, but uh, I think it you a set up into why I chose this subject today. Um, I'm going to force you to talk to each other, which is why I wanted to sort of sit in groups, um, which is happening, which is good because everyone likes each other. Um, and I'm going to pose a few questions that I want you to think about, and I will ask you to give me answers to. They're open-ended. Um, and really don't have an answer, but we'll get there. Um, my argument for my uh, senior lecture is, is that science is a social construction, and that medicine necessitates critical thinking, and that's sort of the exciting part of medicine and what drew me to choosing this path um, from where I came from. So, why? Um, this is how I got to the subject. Um, this is my representation of the pre-attending. So, that's me, that's everyone who is on ship with me, um, and the revolutionary changing of colors in the quad schedule, <laughs> who is presenting, um, really, mind shattering. Um, so, uh, I love pre-attending, especially when it's um, sort of a supportive role. Uh, it's really terrifying when it's not. But um, one thing that came from it is, is it allows us to talk to each other and sort of go through what you're thinking um, amongst colleagues about patient care and what you want to do for your patient. It gave me a huge amount of respect for how uh, everyone kind of gets to their treatment plan, um, how everyone approaches patient care. And it's, kind of, it's an amazing thing just from that perspective um, in, uh, as, as a role for us in residency. Um, what made me want to do this talk is that I kept hearing things like, there's no evidence for that, but I want to. Um, I don't know what the evidence is, or there's no science behind that, or I want to do this, but I read something that was contradictory to what I think my treatment plan should be for my specific patient. Um, and it was this, this earnest kind of like, I want to do the right thing, but science is telling me I shouldn't because there's this trial that had a bunch of people that says that I'm really a, a moron for ordering a troponin on this person. So that's where this comes from. I feel like the movement towards evidence-based medicine is an amazing thing and I think it brought um, some sense of checks and balances and critical thinking to medicine, but I feel like to a certain degree we are becoming paralyzed by it as well. And that isn't the point, um, because I think, in my own mind, it may be just a lack of recognition of our power within this. Um, so, this sort of got me thinking about how did I get there? Why do I think that it's exciting to want to do something that's not necessarily written about extensively or in agreement with evidence? Um, so it brought me to what I began with in postgraduate education. So I started at the University of Western Ontario um, in Canada, and I met this person. His name is Anton Alahar, and he um, was my thesis supervisor and a dear friend, um, retiring this year. And he also thinks this talk is sort of somewhat ludicrous for this audience, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, it's, so he is a sociologist, um, but trained in political economy. And he introduced me um, in my undergrad. I changed my major, I became a double major um, in sociology and physiology, and ended up doing my master's under him. Um, he introduced me to some people. So he introduced me um, through the sort of books that he writes. This is, uh, they're all amazing books, but not necessarily anything related to what we do here. Um, he is a critical theorist. 
um, and looks really about uh, at power structures and power relations and is heavily influenced by this guy. So this is Karl Marx, for um, everyone who hasn't, who, got, who wouldn't recognize him. Um, he is, uh, everyone kind of knows the, the Communist Manifesto. Um, workers unite, uh, all you have to lose are your chains is sort of the, the larger uh, motto that comes from his writing, the you, all you have to lose are your chain is actually not written in um, the Communist Manifesto, but proletariat unite is. Um, so he is part of the initial founding of critical theory. Um, and critical theory uh, in sociology sort of laid the foundation for, um, um, <laughs> laid the foundation for uh, including human beings in the study of sociology. So. We have agency. We are agents of social change. Critical theory allows for um, using that, um, using human beings in the study of, of society, and also the sort of utilitarian of um, the of their actions being sort of emancipatory, being um, giving us the giving us the tools to be able to make social make social change, um, which led me to read this book. Um, which is sort of the premise of why I wanted to do this talk. Um, so C. Wright Mills uh, is, uh, is a sociologist from the 60s. Um, he actually died in 1962, but he wrote a book called The Sociological Imagination, which sort of brings all of the social theory that I um, read about for a few years together, um, and is sort of the context of why I'm talking today. Um, he talked about the only way that you can understand society and you understand your place in it is by grasping history and the individual. Um, in order to understand either, you have to understand both. And we have um, our kind of uh, understanding of society and our actions are very much informed by the history in which we exist and um, came to from. So, that, having said that, um, I wanted to sort of read you something that I hope informs what you see as your education and also this sort of basis of why I think our place in medicine and our criticism of it and ensuring that it moves forward is important. So this is from um, Alihar's bio, if you go online, he uh, has, a, has a philosophy of teaching, um, which is uh, kind of amazing because I was, I was his student when he, when he wrote this. So. My philosophy of teaching and education is described as a critical, democratic, and egalitarian. It deals with the dynamic tension between the individual and society and highlights the need for the individual to be made aware of their social responsibility. I'm convinced that society is only as strong as its least educated citizen. And to this end, the purpose of education is to strengthen the community, whether it be local, provincial, national, or even international. So we get to be those people. We get to be at the interface of what happens in a lab and what gets to be practiced in, in our training, um, which is super exciting to me, and I hope it's exciting for you. So that's the setup. Now you can talk to each other. <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to pose some questions. Um, I want you to think amongst yourselves, and then I will ask you because I now know all your names is what is science, what is knowledge, and what is fact. I will be getting to what I will define them as. <laughs> They're open-ended questions, and it's obviously not something that I think we've done here before. Um, but I think you'll be surprised by what you think. All right. For the six people, <laughs> discuss. What is science? 